So they mean it one way, and they use that term when they're talking to the general public, and the general public understands them as being unsure, which leaves, right, which leaves the impression that scientists are unreliable or untrustworthy. So he doesn't really know what he's talking about, he's not really sure, so that, so scientists have not been really good about expressing the level of their concern, because, because but for, for the, professional reasons, they're careful with their language. On yeah. the other hand, when scientists, I know for sure, because I've encountered it recently, if you leave out the qualifiers, then they say, oh, you're overhyping it. Right, right. But I mean, so it's right. a... Uh, and it's part of the denial machine. Political yeah. ideology comes no. in there, right, to yeah. say, do the whatever it wants. It, you know, no matter which way you go, it's they win, you lose. If you've read the IPCC, I don't know if right. people have read that, but it's all in that very, right. uh, we, we can only stand by this, this much percent. I mean, it's very, right. uh, and we're in the age of specialization. So when you mention we need more disciplines coming in, that to me is reconfirmed over and over and over again. It seems to me that, you know, the IPCC, I mean, it's easy, it's easy. <laughs> what a report. It, yeah, um, I mean, I, I have read a big chunk of it. Um, and it seems to me that the way that they do it there is very appropriate for that report. You wouldn't, sure. you wouldn't want yeah. to do something other than use very yeah. scientific yeah. language. But it's like, I don't see any reason why scientists couldn't say, um, I'm going to talk about this as a human being. I mean, say that, you know, mm -hmm. maybe they say their scientific thing and then say, I'm going to talk about this as a human being, and then they don't have to use that scientific language. I mean, there's no reason that they can't do both roles and just say which well, role, role that they're in, well, in my opinion. Well, that they psychologically have a hard time talking about it as a human being because they would have a hard time getting up every morning and doing their work. But well, there's another if they got into that. I mean, it's hard for them. Well, not only that, but James Hansen and Michael Mann have done that, and they have been threatened. Right? Exactly. Been threatened. Been for their lives. And in mm -hmm. Hansen storms at my grandchildren. You open up the first page, and it's a picture of his granddaughter. Mm -hmm. I mean, personal. You know, mm -hmm. it's me who's talking here, not just a scientist. Mm -hmm. Also, our psychology does not recognize as readily threats that we perceive as distant. This is what I said before, we need to create proximity by emphasizing that climate change is happening here and now. Definitely. We need, now this is a, a, interesting, we express climate change as an opportunity to restore past loss. I don't know if I can explain this well. It explains in the book that we feel much more deeply if we have lost something than if we have a chance to gain something. Mm -hmm. um, so we say, yeah. Research suggests that people are more motivated to restore lost environmental quality than improve current environmental quality. I, I do have a climate change denying cousin that keeps wanting to go back to the 1800s. The loss could be social, lost community, values, purpose, or environmental. Lost ecosystems, species, or beauty. Um, yeah. Several years ago, I was asked to go uh, to help do some lobbying uh, to Congress about uh, the environmental issues that uh, had particularly to do with uh, water at that time. And the uh, Wildlife Federation was the group that had asked me to work. And when I arrived, it was almost as though the place was in mourning. It was um, really a very low ebb of energy, and it was very depressing. And what had happened is that this group had just gone through a period of triage. And they were looking at their funding, and they were looking at the projects many had worked on for years, that all of a sudden, because of climate change, they were now having to move further away for the area where there was a possibility of success. And these people who had dedicated tremendous amounts of energy and time were truly in the morning. Yeah. 
the loss of all yes. of that caring. And, and so I think this example <coughs> is a very, very strong. Yeah, yeah and, and I think that word needs to be used more than the two loss. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, and there were probably people who were highly nature connected. Oh, very much so. Mm -hmm. So they could get they in touch with that. They lived in the middle of it, and, and there had been periods where they felt they were making progress, you know, and yeah. it was. It was so exciting to be on the the uh, the growth end of it, but then all of a sudden to have to acknowledge the lack of realism was just devastating. Recognize moments of proximity that can demand attention. I put this on because it's so relevant for this particular time. These may be moments of political decision making, collective action, or generated conflict. For example, the KXL pipeline conflict. Of course, now it's the North Dakota pipeline conflict. Saying the pipeline would only ever be a small part of overall emissions is missing the point. Like saying that the location of seats at the lunch counter of the Greensboro Woolworths or on the Montgomery buses were trifling examples of racial segregation creating a symbolic moment may be more important than its overall relevance. <laughs> now, this is where I, I really asked Joanna to come. <laughs> Open up a conversation about long-term preparedness, which Joanna has been working on for a number of years. Preparedness and adaptation are routes for people to accept that climate change is real and already underway. And like Wally was saying and we were saying earlier, something that we can all work on together. We are all in this together. Extreme weather events create a moment of proximity and heightened awareness, but also of the increased in-group loyalty and anxiety that can readily exclude consideration of climate change even when confronted with direct evidence of climate extremes, the main influence on people's attitudes will still be the views of the people they know and trust. But if we work together, like we work, we went to get to know the people from the emergency management. I would never have gone to see them and they didn't believe in climate change, but we started establishing, at any rate, we started establishing a relationship based on that. I, as a remote interpreter of Spanish English, yesterday afternoon I interpreted for a fellow in South Louisiana from, from Gonzalez, Louisiana, and he was asking for funds from FEMA and from another organization. And then I work with a lot of ICE detainees so that I see this migration from the South to right. the North. So I see this daily, you know, the things that to me represent climate change. And I'm a tiny little bitty cog in trying to help those who have been affected one way or another. So it touches me on a personal level there in part of my profession. It touches me on our farm when I see things happening on our farm. Yeah. And I'm so close to nature. So I mean yeah. Well you're coming in direct contact on a regular basis with people that are environmental refugees. That's right. Also asylum from abusive governments and also um, economic refugees. But um, climate change refugees, so they may not say that. But, right. but, but we will yeah. recognize some mm -hmm. stuff. So Joanna, are you seeing um, a response from people talking about the fairness that the people that you might not have connected with about climate change? I have, and you know, when I think about that, I I still think about that as a one that you just used. That was the initial, um, see, I guess, in my own mind of, of recognizing the opportunity for common ground when you are, you know, in the terms of resilience versus mitigation. Um, because we've got to have both at this point. Um, but I do, I do see hope in finding more common ground when, when discussing adaptation um, with people who still perceive climate change as something that is if, it, if, it's, if it's really happening, it's something that we don't need to worry about right now. But despite you know, that mind frame, folks who deal in risk management are more comfortable talking about adaptation and resilience, you know, because that's something that is relatable. You don't have to get into your political ideology. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah. That's in their job description. <laughs> yeah. But you know the, the thing that gets me is that our true allies ought to be real conservatives because conservative and conservation have the same root. Right. You know, and, and so all these conservatives, people, oh, I'm a conservative. No, no, you're not. You're not interested in conservation. Yeah. They want to get rid of the EPA, they want to get rid of the Environment, the uh, Endangered Species Act, they want to get rid of all the regulation on polluting industries, and so forth. Those people aren't conservatives. Well, there are more reasons than that. The CCL is actively con con uh, courting conservatives because the CCL policy and part of the community is basically a conservative mm -hmm. economic policy. Mm -hmm. And we're really trying to frame it that way. And we're getting more and more conservatives on board. Mm -hmm. So it's, in fact, ExxonMobil now has such a bad rap because of their um, line about um, their research about climate change that so they've actually definitely come out for carbon being dividend. We'll see the health centers they are. But that's pretty incredible. Yeah. yeah. We need a narrative of positive change in which our adaptation to climate change does not just protect, protect what is already here, but also creates a more just and equitable world. Not everyone wants to protect the status quo, especially those who are struggling against economic and social injustice. So we need a narrative of positive change, but we don't need something like this group you mentioned, sustainable or sustainment or so, some group that is talking about this great world that we can have with all this technological innovation and everybody can, you know, drive uh, this electric car and everybody is in business suits taking their solar helicopter to work or whatever because there are billions of people who are just getting by if that it's not realistic it's just not no and, and so we have or to like your, your relative who wants to go back to the 1800s right mm -hmm. and it's like also what nancy was talking about earlier where you can overwhelm with uh, information about climate change, but you don't want to, what was the other word? Magical solution. Magical solutions. And one of the things that magical solutions is people are talking about geoengineering and Bill Gates and this other, some people want to support that and that is not the direction we want to go. So we have to find something between um, overwhelming magical thinking. I really like that, that frame for it. The commercial authority of sciences, the science and engineering is done a number of exhaustive studies on geoengineering and they say hey it doesn't work it doesn't work well, yeah, it's just if, too dangerous you know if yeah you know if you want to make it work you've got to really invest a lot in research and it will probably never work because there are always going to be unanticipated side effects that do more damage than yeah. um, your geoengineering is helping. Now this one was kind of brief. I, I did have something to say on the narrative of positive, positive change. I think a lot of the issue about a narrative of positive change is that a lot of people in the industrialized countries are going to have a lot less than they have now. They're right. going to have right. a world that is um, livable and where nature is going to survive and anything like yeah, what that it's has, meant to be. And it has and, to be framed and, as a positive change. Right, right, right. right. it does. Right. And I personally see it as a very positive change, especially sure. if we end up with real community with each other right. and exactly. real relationships with nature. I mean, our relationship with nature has been destroyed. Right. That seems like the biggest um, thing that we, that we can return to. Um, right. It would be amazing. And with we, each other. We yeah. have to add to that. I'm sorry. <coughs> and with each other. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 start out with that. The same community. Yeah. 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 We have such a false ideology with consumerism. It's just a, such a tremendous sadness to mm -hmm. stuff. But it's like getting addicted to Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now this, again, is back to the narrative, which is hard for me to wrap my mind around, but I'm starting to get it. 
Follow narrative rules of recognizable actors, motives, causes, and effects. Climate change is a narrative shaped through social negotiations and transmitted between peers. People form their response to the narratives, not the science. People will be inclined to follow the most compelling narrative, so don't let the narrative take over the way we think or talk about it, because our narrative could become, like we were talking about earlier, exceptionally positive or exceptionally negative, or just not really based on scientific facts, so you don't talk about the science, you create a narrative that makes sense and that is sincere, honest, authentic, um, but, but you don't let one aspect of it take over. Does anyone else have any other insights? Do you have any examples of what he means by that? Uh, he does, but you know, to, to be honest to you, with you, and I'm being authentic here, this is the hardest one for me to get. You'll have to read the book. It's worth <laughs> reading the book. I think it has to do with false emotional narratives that catch people's heart, and they go the wrong, they, instead of thinking it out and having the balance. I think that's what he's meaning. You have to have a balance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. emotional narrative is the polar bears. Swimming across, you know, but you need to grab that is people. Working. That's not the kind of narrative he's talking about. But you're supposed to grab people person. that way as well. But it's not grab people enough with the polar bears. He's already no, said right. that. Yeah. So it's a different kind of narrative yeah. from that. Maybe penguins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would just advise you all to do what I've been doing the last two weeks and mull this over and see how it operates in our lives. I'm just I'm coming to some kind of understanding about narrative if you're doing that. Recognizing that this is hard for me. Do you have some? Well, I guess the only thing that uh, I will say, and this has just been a change for me recently in doing all this kind of emotional work on climate change, is that, um, and this sounds terrible, but I'll say it, um, rather than looking, and this is a change in narrative, rather than looking at that person as a Republican or a climate change denier or anything else. In all honesty, the way I'm conceptualizing that person now is somebody whose grandchildren are also going to die. Mm -hmm. I think that's really insightful. You know, I mean, they are going to be affected yeah. just as my grandchildren are going to be affected. Right. And I feel a lot of compassion for that person, mm -hmm. no matter where they're coming from. And they're, and they're, I feel a lot of compassion. I mean, this affects us all. We're all in this together. I think that that's really helpful. Resist simple framings and be open to new meanings. We interpret climate change through frames which focus our attention but limit our understanding, allow us to ignore meanings that lie outside the frame that it is an environmental issue. That is really, it is an environmental issue. It's also an economic, social justice, psychological, political issue. I mean, it covers everything. There is nothing that it does not, be relational, nothing that it does not touch. Um, in fact, he ran into problems with this, like the uh, Amnesty International would not do anything with climate change because they said, well, that's an entire new issue. It doesn't affect us. Mm -hmm. That's just not true, <laughs> considering the number of climate refugees that there are. Considering it a threat or an, or an opportunity, but not both. It's both. This would be, I, I got, he went into this a long time, a well-head problem or a tail mm -hmm. problem, but not both. He said the um, people in government want to look at, at it as a tailpipe problem where uh, the fossil fuel gets used mm -hmm. as and us. And emissions. emissions. That's where we're the problem. So we're the problem, but they can keep digging it up and mining it and getting it, you know, all of that, because the problem was, is with us. In fact, he mentioned it. I don't remember if I put it on a slide or not, maybe I did. But Hillary Clinton spent one morning um, on a ship examining, investigating melting ice in the Arctic, and in the afternoon she had a meeting with State Oil and Exxon about drilling in the Arctic. <laughs> 
So it's, it's uh, another example we used was that we don't see that it's odd that shell oil is putting on huge environmental limits. Right. Huge environmental limits. Right. And then, and then, and then, was it at Shell where um, they were excessively worried about he might slip on the steps? He right. might slip. <laughs> he might what? He might slip. He was trying, he was walking up. At World Headquarters for Shell. He, he went up and they. Safety he, rules. Right. So he's. So he's there standing ready to register and they say, sir, sir, your shoelace is not dry, you might trip. <laughs> so we're excessively concerned about safety here, since I could tell you things about safety and shell. <laughs> Ensure that a wide range of solutions is constantly under review. He calls this iterative risk management. Climate change is a wicked problem. That is, as opposed to a pain problem with a defined cause or objective, a wicked problem is complex, systemic, a system of a large chain of adjacent issues. And I think Naomi Klein did a perfect example of explaining that chain of adjacent issues, connection with the economy and everything else. Policymakers can become locked into these simple one-off solutions that solve tamer problems. For example, it can be seen as a moral problem, a human rights problem, an energy problem, a social justice problem, a land use problem, a governance problem, an ideological battle between left and right worldviews, or a lack of respect for God's creation. These attitudes could justify action or inaction, Amnesty International, as I said, saying it is an environmental issue alone. I want to go on to the next part. And this is something that we have done as environmentalists so many times. Precedents and presidents, in this chapter called Precedents and Presidents, describes three recent precedents of proven success in international cooperation that have been assumed to be similar to climate change, but in actuality have important differences. These are the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, control of ozone depleting chemicals, market-based policies controlling SOX and NOx, causing, you know, like sodium dioxide and nitrosoxide, causing acid rain. This led to the development of cap and trade, which so far has not worked to control CO2 emissions. He says it's really, they're really such different problems because those were like more linear dealing with SOX and NOx and climate change, which talk about is wicked, totally systemic. You cannot solve it in the same way. Chapter 31. Arms reduction, ozone depletion, and sulfur emission should never have been chosen as models for action on climate change. These were attained problems with well-defined and achievable ends. Climate change is a wicked problem altogether more daunting scale, complexity, and uncertainty. These precedents found climate change to a limited set of meanings that actively excluded other approaches as an environmental issue and therefore not a resource, energy, economic, health, or a social rights issue. <laughs> we are, the CCL has made some wonderful collaborations with South Arkansas, which previous to this has been focused on social justice issues because being predominantly African American, they have dealt with serious um, voting rights irregularities and um, social justice education issues. But we are really seeing how our, as we connect with them more and more, how our, our issues overlap. And in fact, this past year, two uh, African American members of the Environmental Caucus, or I mean, of the CFC caucus in South Arkansas went to the CCL um, um, conference in DC. And they're talking more and more about environmental impacts from toxins. We're really looking at population. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is again about the SOX and NOx. They determined that it would best be managed through emissions trading, not regulation, taxing, and rationing. But the largest and most damaging restraining of all acquired from referring to the precedence of ozone depletion and acid rain was that climate change could be defined exclusively as a problem of gases. This may well prove to be a failure. It is too much of a wicked problem because I'm not sure exactly what he means here, particularly, but 
we have been talking about how much of it's also an economic problem. Gene was talking about consumption, our way of life, the whole thing is so. And then the tailpipe versus flow. Right. right. Was he saying that we need to look at it as both a tailpipe and a wellhead issue? It's yeah. a, it's a yes. full yes. spectrum. Yes. That we're yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I'm going to get into that. Oh, th I think there's a slide that is coming up that talks about that um, more, but really um, what the uh, corporations are doing that on, at that is saying that it's our problem, not their problem. The, the big fight in trying to educate on the fracking was to have full life cycle analysis mm -hmm. so that people were looking at the, the full spectrum. Right. And, and you always see yourself at some point mm -hmm. in that life cycle. Yeah. Shelly, didn't you want to show that 20 minute? I film? did. I'm, Do you need to skip some of this? I, I, I'm almost done. Okay. 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 Never accept. Because I saw you on page 167 and it's 240 or something. Yeah. <laughs> this is at the end. Never accept your opponent's frames. Psych off rights. Don't negate them or repeat them or structure your arguments to counter them. Hmm. Arguments that renewable energy brings greater energy security encourages expansion of domestic fossil fuels. What other aspects would be better to emphasize? Saying the low carbon economy brings jobs becomes vulnerable to evidence that the high carbon economy might bring more jobs. So we might want to emphasize something else. I do want to get through this quickly because I do want to play you this um, this uh, video that he made. It's so good. Be careful that enemy narratives do not fuel division. Look for common purpose. Enemies that may do us harm engage our moral brain and energize our outrage. Climate change lacks clear enemies. We're all complicit in all we suffer. If a social movement needs an enemy, create an heroic quest in which the enemy may be our internal weaknesses rather than an outside group. Man, I really need those new shoes. 